And so most of you who are already using OCT probably know that kind of the mainstay of the type of scan that you'll use is a line scan. And a line scan is a very quick uh, one-dimensional scan. It gives you a, a real-time um, uh, real cross-sectional view of a vaulting lens on the cornea. Um, we use line scans. We also use cross line scans, which we're going to go over in the next couple slides. Right here. Go back there for a second. Back a little bit. Okay. Um, Barry's going to talk about uh, radial scans and 3D corneal scans as well. So here is the cross scan, which is really the mainstay of what we do, at least initially in the central portion of the analysis of vaulting lenses. As you can see, you get a vertical and horizontal uh, cut. And, um, and then, of course, with the tools that we have. H hang on, Barry, go ahead. for a second. Um, so with the, we just contradicted each other. And let's, so let's refine that a little go bit. Ahead. I said line scan. You said cross scan. Is in the, the center. Answer. And I think we, we actually were talking about the same thing, but in a different way. Two different so every, every patient that we put in front of an OCT, the very first thing we do is a cross scan. And then once we do that cross scan and we identify some potential uh, danger zones or some potential areas that we want to focus on, then we're using line scans to focus in on that. And so the, the initial scan we all we both do is a cross scan, but then we refine it with a bunch of line scans. So a radial scan is something that I've been playing around with uh, based upon suggestions from some other folks who utilize this system. And the radial scan is obvious is what you can see here. You're getting all these radial cuts. And then when we get the uh, actual image, we can then rotate that cut along the uh, cornea accordingly, and we can go around the clock 360 degrees. A 3D scan gives us, as indicated, kind of a chunk of the cornea. And one of the things I do personally is in an area of concern, I'm able to then scan up and down. And then you'll see the vertical and horizontal as this line is moving up and down. And we actually can uh, record videos as well. So you'll see a little case later on where we use it. Wait, Barry, Go let's ahead, go back, back to up. that for a second. Let's refine that a little bit. And you know, the, the real key to this is, if you think there's an area, uh, a danger zone, where that contact lens is bearing or something, you want to focus this focal area in that area. And then by manipulating that vertical red line and the, the horizontal green line, mm -hmm. you just kind of drag it you can focus exactly on the area that you're right. looking at in two dimensions. So for example, you'll see in a little while an area that we were suspicious that there was a zone of bearing of a lens. And as you went down along in that 3, 3D zone, you could see that the vault was decreasing, decreasing, decreasing to the point where it actually did come into contact. Okay, um, Imaging is we're, we're talking about fitting lenses and uh, assessing vaulting lenses. And that's obviously very, very critical to what we do. But we also use this for some amazing quality of imaging. And these are just a variety of different images of patients that we've seen. This was one I had actually published. I, I can't remember if it was contact lens today or something, where a patient had dimple veil. And you can actually see the impressions in the epithelium from dimple veil images of intact in there. This was a case we did publish in review of cornea and contact lens on management of VLK, and you saw a phenomenal image of vascularized limbal keratitis with epithelial uh, hypertrophy there as well. Another area that we use for imaging is angle assessment. And as we can see, a variety of different types, narrow angle, a recessed angle, appositional closure, as you can see here, and, and a normal angle as well. So now your case, you might want to I, I love this case because this is yet another uh, reason why anterior segment OCT is so critical in your practice. This guy comes in on an emergent basis. Uh, he was hammering. He was a, a construction guy, and he was hammering a junction box, a plastic junction box. And all of a sudden, he felt a sharp pain. And so you know, we looked at him with a slit lamp. And obviously, you can see a laceration, a corneal lamp laceration here. And so what is the first thing you have to do when you're assessing a corneal laceration? What, what do you have to figure out? If it's a full thickness laceration or if it's a partial thickness laceration. Because full thickness lacerations are always surgical um, and they must be sent off immediately. Um, partial thickness lacerations are med uh, managed medically. So you know, we saw this image in the slit lamp and then we took an OCT. And clear as day, you can see that this is a, it's a deep 
but it's a partial thickness laceration. So immediately, I feel better about managing this case. Um, you know, we took this image, uh, and then we took a few more images, and lo and behold, look at that. Anyone notice what's going on there? Speak up. What do we see in that cornea? We see a retained foreign body right there. Now, you know, I'm not going to go in and dig that out. Look how deep that is. That's about 50% of the thickness of the cornea. And so the next question is, what was that junction box made out of? And so we did a little bit of research. We figured out it was made out of PVC plastic. And we researched that PVC plastic, much like PMMA, can stay in uh, human tissue. Because remember, um, where did the first PMMA contact lenses come from? What was the genesis of PMMA? The reason that material was used was because World War II fighter pilots uh, who were shot up, the canopies were made out of PMMA plastic. And the, the flight surgeons realized that that PMMA did not react with the corneal tissue. And they said, hey, maybe we can use this plastic for therapeutic purposes. And that was really the genesis of PMMA contact lenses. Uh, Greg Jamolis uh, published a paper, and this was a seminal paper back in 2008, right when anterior segment OCT came out, um, that really, I mean, he got it into the literature. And that is so critically important because when we talk about, you know, medically necessary procedures, there has to be evidence in the literature. So this was one of the first papers out there. And when I'm writing a letter to an insurance company who may have denied an anterior segment OCT, most of them actually cover it, but there's one in particular that we deal with uh, that doesn't cover it. And so I write uh, letters of medical necessity. You know, we cite all these papers. Barry? Yeah, so basically getting into the assessment of vaulting lenses, we're utilizing this high resolution anterior segment OCT to actually make very accurate assessments of the degree of vaulting in microns. And we can do that along various areas, as well as to evaluate how these lenses also land on the scleral areas as well. Um, and of course, you know, dependent upon the specific condition, we're going to be looking to fit lenses perhaps a little bit differently as well. Um, typically in our ocular surface cases, we're dealing with normal, regular uh, corneas in terms of their topographic shape. So you're not going to have the tremendous irregularities that we get in keratoconus or post-LASIK ectasia and those sorts of things. So we're going to see different requirements. The more irregular that cornea is, the more you have to be careful that things might look good in one area and look really bad in another area. So you really have to be careful about that. And incorporating and combining your corneal topography, your corneal tomography, along with anterior segment OCT, I think goes a long way in those irregular corneas. So here we can see that classic tool, that little measurement line that we can use to actually create a little area where we can measure in microns the exact vault. And we could see on the right 68 microns of vault in that particular area. So that tool is used, and you can use it in any area underneath that lens. You know, we use our caliper tool not only for uh, measuring vault, but we will measure um, areas of bearing uh, on the cornea. And so if Go a left. scleral lens or a hybrid lens is bearing against the eye, I want to measure that so that when I get my new lens, I want to see, number one, did I clear that area? Number two, is my bearing less? Am I, am I doing the right kind of adjustments with my parameters? Am I going in the right direction, really? Yeah, and obviously can use that same tool to measure lesions in the cornea, any kind of measurement. It's a measurement tool. Um, this is really important. Uh, Jeff and I were just talking about that before. When you're doing a diagnostic evaluation, you're putting a variety of different lenses of different parameters on the eyes, and you're doing these OCT images, uh, often you can't remember what the heck lens was on the eye. Well, there's a tool here, and you see that little letter A in the OptiView, and it allows you to actually type in some of the key identifying elements, you know, the design, the vault, the diameter, whatever you want to put in there, which my, is really helpful. My texts are under strict instructions that every OCT that is taken is labeled. Because, you know, oftentimes if we're doing a diagnostic fitting, I'm putting three, four, five lenses on that patient 
before they leave. And if they're not explicitly labeled each time, who the heck knows no. which lens was which? Absolutely. Uh, so then the question when we're talking about vault is, what is the optimal vault of some of these lenses that we're using? Um, a colleague and I published a paper uh, a couple years ago uh, looking in scleral lenses, what is the optimal vault? And so we took a case series of 13 subjects, I think it was, 12 subjects, um, and we looked at successful patients in scleral lenses, and we looked at the exact vaults that that, that that patient left the office in, and we came up with the idea that there is no optimal vault. You can have successful patients in 200 microns of vault all the way up to 600 microns of vault. And so that number is somewhat arbitrary. But now Barry and I were just talking again before this talk about, well, you know, everyone kind of notices that when you get up into those 600 micron vaults, 800 micron vaults, the patients don't see very well, right? Do you guys notice this? How many in the audience have noticed that? Yeah. Here's I mean, the problem. There's not one citation in the peer-reviewed literature that indicates that. That is unsubstantiated, so that it, it's anecdotal at this point. So if anybody's bored and wants to publish that, we could really use that data. And I was just telling Jeff that the other day we had a patient in who was in a, a scleral lens design that was even only at about 400 microns or so of vault. We ended up, and his vision, he came in wearing corneal GP lenses and um, we refit him into sclerals for physiological reasons. And um, when we fit him, uh, the fit looked beautiful, to be honest with you, but he just lost about two lines of acuity. Over-refraction didn't help. Toric, you know, spherocylindrical over-refraction didn't help either. And uh, so I said, well, maybe it is the vault. So we ordered lens, tried to decrease the vault for about, by about 150 microns, if I remember correctly, and it didn't really make a hell of a lot of difference. It made a little bit of a difference. I then, at that same dispensing visit, took those lenses off because he was not happy with his vision, and we a ended up refitting him in a vaulting hybrid, which had about 100 to 125 microns of vault, and boom, his acuity went to as good as it was with his corneal GPs. So anecdotal, yes, but you know that's the way we practice a little bit sometimes. I love to have evidence base for everything, but until we have that evidence, we still have to keep that in mind. The, the other question I have for you, you know, many times we're told to, in ocular surface disease cases, you want more vault. But I would agree there, in terms of comfort and management of that ocular surface, I don't think you need 600, 800 microns of vault at all, as long as you're getting full vault and obviously over the limbus and so on, would you agree? Well, you know, Langis uh, published a paper, a very good paper, that looked at theoretical oxygen tension uh, under scleral lenses. And they came up with criteria that established kind of the minimum level of, of fitting criterion that you need to do to not produce uh, corneal edema under a scleral lens. Now, did, did that paper, and I could be wrong in my memory about it, but if I remember, was it like two, it had to be, try to be under 200 microns, even with the highest material? You have material? to be no greater than 200 microns of vault. The thickness of the lens has to be no greater than 250 microns and it has to be made out of the highest DK material available, which is Boston XO2. Now, that's wonderful in theory, but the issue is uh, virtually no scleral lenses are being fit that way. The vault is easy to control, but the problem is the thickness is not easy to control because at, those, at, at that thin level, you have flexure that becomes a mm -hmm. significant issue, and Boston XO2 is a wonderful, it's a high DK material, but when you have an ocular surface disease patient, it tends not to wet very well. Right. So we are making compromises in our scleral fits. Everyone in this room is, and the, the verdict is still out as to what long-term you know, complications that's gonna produce. Yeah. And lens settling, we all have heard about it. There have been papers written about it, but it's something we have to consider. So you may observe a scleral lens, take your measurements, and it looks absolutely the way you want it to be all the time. But you have to realize that these lenses settle down 80, 100 microns after X number of hours of wear. So you have to keep that in mind and predict that when you're first dispensing the lens to realize that you are going to get settling. And make sure you keep in mind what their wearing time is, how many hours those lenses have been on when you're taking the measurement. 
We're, we're going to publish, um, we're going to present at BCLA this year results of a clinical study that we did uh, with the hybrid lenses, the vaulting hybrid lenses, uh, on how much settle there actually is. Okay. So there we see a nice cross line scan on an irregular cornea for the center. As Jeff said, we start out typically that with our default scan. And on the vertical scan, you can see here, you know, we take a slice right through the central cornea here, and we know that in most cones, the cone is inferior in the cornea. And so what we want to do is we want to measure the vault over the highest point of the cornea to the closest to the back surface that it goes. But um, that may not be the most accurate way to look at a horizontal scan, right? Because right back in this one, this is not the apex of the cone. So what we do is we take a line scan down below, and we take a line scan about where the apex of the cone is going to be, and then we can identify areas where that lens is coming close to the mm -hmm. cornea. And that is just illustrated here as well. I think this is, this is a hybrid lens, as it were. So the question is, uh, my, you know, my techs are instructed to do this. Um, are, are we doing anterior segment OCTs on just the fitting? Or are we doing it on the follow-ups? And we take anterior segment OCT any time that we are evaluating, um, and Rampakis is going to like this, any time we're evaluating the corneal health in the presence of a contact lens, right? It's critical. I mean, that's what, that's exactly what we're doing is we're making sure that what we are fitting on that patient is not going to cause physiologic damage. I'm going to address that because that's an issue to me too. You don't want to be running anterior segment OCTs on totally ill-fitting lenses. So what we do in, in, at our practice is when a lens is first put on, we'll put fluorescein in the bulb. We're going to look. The techs already know how to know. They'll see if a lens is bearing. We're not doing an OCT on a lens that I see bearing with fluorescein, right? Or if it's way too much vault. So when I tell them, when we get the lens, and they know what to do in terms of changing. I said, when you get a lens that looks pretty good, go take the OCTs. That's pretty much how you we know, do we it. We do that with hybrid lenses, but with scleral lenses, I, I don't think you can get a good approximation from a technician. Um, well, I think it depends on your technician. Yeah. Our technicians are pretty good. Plus, we have interns who also are pretty trained at that. But I got to tell you, sometimes they'll be wrong, but most of the time they'll be right. Um, but they'll surely know when it's excessively steep or bearing. I mean, they know what a dark spot in the center looks like. And, you know, I don't want them to run an OCT on a lens that I know there's no chance that I'm going to ever prescribe. 